Greetings and welcome back to our Voices of Faith Freedom series. Uh, this month, celebrating Native American Heritage Month. And with that, we have our Voices of Native American Faith Freedom. I am honored today to have Arthur Mark Charles with us uh, to have this conversation. And I should say also former 2020 presidential candidate, Mark Charles, in this discussion with me today. How are we doing today, Mark? Good, thank you so much for having me, Charles. I'm honored to be with you. Um, if I can, I'd like to just introduce myself uh, traditionally. So, Yat E, Mark Charles Yinashia, Tsin Bake Dene Nishle, Dr. Huglini Bashachin, Tsin Bake Dene Dashache, Dr. Luchini Dashanella. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're matrilineal as a people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. So my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say Tsin Bake Dene'a. Loosely translated, it means I'm from the wooden shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother, is Tohiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Tsin Bake Dene'a. And then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Tohiglini, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I also just want to acknowledge I'm speaking to you today um, from what's now known as Washington, D.C. My family and I moved here from the Navajo Nation about six years ago, and these are the traditional lands of the Piscataway. And I want to honor the Piscataway as the indigenous hosts of these lands. I want to thank them for their stewardship of these lands and just state how humbled I am to be living on these lands today. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. You know, that kind of uh, goes into the first question we had of uh, describing your family story here in America and, uh, you know, your, your ancestry and, and your tribe. Could you give us a little more history of, of your tribe and uh, ancestry here in America? Yeah, so, I mean, as, as I we were talking earlier before this show, you know, I could easily talk on, you're going to ask me several questions, and I could easily talk on any of them for uh, a few hours. But um, my my family's history in this land is I am very much the son of both my mother and my father. My mother is American of Dutch heritage. My father is Navajo. I don't refer to myself as half. I refer to myself as both. Um, and so I grew up, um, my, my parents met with actually at a mission compound in the state of New Mexico run by the Christian Reformed Church. Um, and it was actually started in the early 1900s as a boarding school where the Christian Reformed Church, like many other denominations around the country, as well as the federal government, ran these boarding schools, which were technically ways to forcibly assimilate children to, native, to Western European culture. So children were taken from their homes. They were put in these military-style boarding schools. They were punished for speaking their languages, punished for practicing their culture. You know, the stories of abuse I've heard personally of people who have survived these boarding schools is gut-wrenching. And the last of them, like Rehoboth, didn't stop operating as a boarding school until the 1980s and some even until the 90s. So I was attending Rehoboth when it was transitioning from a boarding school to a day school. Um, I was there as a day school student. I had many friends and other classmates who were there as boarding school students. And realized that a lot of our, frequently our experiences were very different. But my grandparents were also boarding school survivors. And so they, even though they both became Christians, my grandmother became a Christian in the boarding school, but that meant that the faith that they adopted was highly colonial. You know, essentially these boarding schools taught that to be a Christian, you had to be an American. And so you had to give up your pagan culture and you had to embrace western european culture so we gave up things like laughing parties and greeting the sunrise with our prayers so that we could enjoy the easter bunny and santa claus and you know it was just it was too very it was it was highly assimilated and i grew up in that environment and ever since uh college i've been kind of on a journey of understanding what does it mean to be Native American, to be Navajo, but also to be a Christian? How do I follow Jesus as a Navajo man? And I i mean, there's so many things I could talk about. One of the things I've, I've done over the course of my life is I'm a founding partner in a, a 
student conference that we started with InterVarsity and Canvas Crusade, as well as my work with Calvin uh, University. And we started a conference called Would Jesus Eat Fry Bread? Mm. And it was a conference where we could invite in native students from all over the country and give them a space to ask the question, what does it mean to be native and be Christian? Because unfortunately, in most churches, especially churches on reservations, they will be told to be a, a real follower of Christ, you have to be an American. Um, they will not affirm the culture, they will not allow the space to ask those kind of questions. And so that's very much a part of my journey. And, you know, one of the things I describe myself is I am looking at, at our nation's history through the lens of faith, culture, faith and culture, and what does it mean for us to move together forward in a way that looks better than what it was in the past. Okay. Well, you know, you, the way you just described that, you know, we, we, we definitely uh, have different cultures that have some, a similar story here, here in America as, as far as taking away of what, what was before and colonized to be a certain uh, religion or a certain way or stripping of the culture in that way. And so you, you mentioned how you transition and, and, and are trying to still on a journey how to be a Christian um, man in, in America, Native American man in, in America. So uh, I could go two ways with this, but I, I think we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go this way. Because I think, I think a history lesson has to be done before I ask you uh, uh, any more of that. And that history lesson deals a lot with the book that uh, you co-authored, Unsettling Truths. And the, the big question of what is the doctrine of discovery and what is its continuing legacy now? So can you, can you give a definition to us of, uh, tell us about the doctrine of discovery and why it's still uh, important for us to know about it now? Yeah, I'll give you my five to minute. I can't do an elevator speech. That'd be way too quick. I'll give a, a maybe a five minute. We're stuck in traffic speech with your Uber driver. Um, good. <laughs> so, I have all different versions of this that like, we can give. But so, yeah, I co-authored a book with my good friend, Sung Chan Ra. It's called Unsettling Truths, the Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. And the Doctrine of Discovery, very simply, it's a series of papal bulls edicts of the Catholic Church. Um, they were written between 1452 and 1493. They say things like invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever, reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. It's essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, Whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are less than human and their land is yours to take. So this is the doctrine that allowed European nations to go into Africa, colonize the continent and enslave the people because they did not believe those living there were human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in what they called the New World, which was already inhabited by millions and claimed to have discovered it. The first sentence of the first chapter of our book says you cannot discover lands already inhabited. You can conquer those lands, you can steal them, you can colonize them. You can't discover them unless you believe that the people living there are not fully human. Now, the challenge with this doctrine is it gets embedded into the foundations of the nation. So our Declaration of Independence, which begins with a very inclusive term, we hold these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal. 30 lines later, refers to, it refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. Our constitution, which starts with the inclusive sounding term, we the people, article one, section two, the section that defines who is covered by the constitution, who is a part of this union, it never mentions women, just like the Declaration of Independence that only refers to men. It specifically excludes natives, and it counts Africans as three-fifths of a person. Right. In 1787, that literally leaves white men. And technically, it was only white landowning men who could vote. Correct. And so the ongoing legacy of this doctrine is that it's been embedded into our foundations and we've never fixed it, right? People think we've abolished slavery, but the 13th Amendment doesn't abolish slavery. It says neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime. 
Right, right. Slavery is still legal under the jurisdiction of the criminal justice system. And we incarcerate our citizens at the highest rate of any country in the world. And we incarcerate people of color at three to five times the rate we incarcerate white people. There are Supreme Court cases as recently as 2005 that reference the doctrine of discovery as the legal precedent for land titles. Mm -hmm. This has huge ramifications. And so there are so many things, and this is just talking about the legal implications. We also have this other narrative that goes simultaneously with the doctrine of discovery, which is this notion of American exceptionalism, mm -hmm. which isn't just saying white people, white Americans are better. It's saying white Americans have been chosen by God. And there is this both implicit and explicit belief that white American Christians are God's chosen people. Turtle Island is their promised land. And they have a land covenant with the God of Abraham. This is why we have what's known as a manifest destiny in our history. Right. Now, the problem with a manifest destiny, the problem with claiming promised lands, is if you read the book of Joshua and the book of Deuteronomy, you learn very quickly that when you have promised lands, you have God's permission to commit genocide. Mm -hmm. So as our nation was claiming its manifest destiny as it was expanding from the east coast all the way to the west coast it was literally committing genocide against native peoples in fact in 1851 it was so blatant that peter burnett who was the first governor of california in his state of the state address he said that a war of extermination is taking place between the races is it's happening and he said we can't stop it i'm kind of paraphrasing it until we finish this entire, until, until no one's left alive. Abraham Lincoln, who was a blatant white supremacist. I have two chapters in this book on Abraham Lincoln. I highly encourage people to read it. He was a blatant, unapologetic white supremacist who absolutely did not believe that Black Lives Mattered. And throughout his presidency, one of his primary goals was to complete the transcontinental railway and as he was going through his presidency he was ethnically cleansing the states of minnesota colorado utah and arizona and new mexico of native tribes and native nations he was actually one of the most genocidal presidents in our nation's history as he sought to complete the transcontinental railway and so these are the ongoing legacies of our nation, which is we are founded not just on some minor violence and a few misdeeds in the back. We are founded literally not only on enslavement, but on ethnic cleansing and genocide. And we have these, this notion of white supremacy, racism, and sexism that are still to this day written into the foundations of our nation and that has huge implications for your life, for my life, for the life of so many people living in the United States of America today. And this book is trying to highlight them so that not, we're not trying to shame people. We're not trying to make people feel embarrassed or ashamed. We're trying to, what George Erasmus said in a quote he used when talking about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada, create a common memory. Mm -hmm. He used a quote that said, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build a community, the quote said, you have to start by creating common memory. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to do with this book, so that we can find a way to move forward in a better way. Yeah, and, I, and you know, I would uh, ask that that common memory can't be the common memory that was taught by one set of people. No. <laughs> it, can't be the, it can't be the taught memory of, oh, let's just go back to... Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 19 UK. It can't, it can't be that. It has to be with truths. The common memory has to be with One of the points we make, two of the hardest chapters you will read in this book are chapters 10 and 9 and 10, which deconstruct the mythological legacy of Abraham Lincoln. And we start that chapter by pointing out one of the challenges the United States of America faces is that we've never lost a war that matters. 
we've never given up major assets of land. We've never been disarmed. We've never had a regime change. We've never endured the scorn of the global community. And we know that history is written by the victors. So the United States of America has been able to, for 250 years, write its own history, mm -hmm. right? So today there's a massive uproar, especially in evangelical circles about critical race theory. Well, there are two components of critical race theory that absolutely, I would agree, terrify white evangelicals. Critical race theory, two of its components are A, it lifts up and centers the voice of the marginalized. So you're hearing history taught from the context of the people who were oppressed. When you have your entire history written by the victors, hearing that same history from the perspective of those on the other side of those guns and swords is terrifying because when you write the history as a victor, you frame it in a way that centers and makes yourself look really good. Looks good, correct. The other thing that critical race theory does, which terrifies most Americans, especially white evangelicals, is it assumes our racism and white supremacy is systemic and has been institutionalized. And America is a highly individualistic, it's hyper individualistic. And what this means is that people can claim they don't feel and they don't act racist. And maybe they don't, but you know what? In the United States of America, you don't have to because it's written into our foundations, because it's part of our institutions. You don't have to act or behave racist or white supremacist. Your institutions do it for you. Yeah. And then not only does that happen, but then you call it white privilege, right? White privilege makes it sound like white people have been given a blessing that they just have to learn how to share. Right. Instead of acknowledging, no, this is a racial injustice that we actually need to confront. Okay. And change. And, and absolutely. And, and then change it. And so these are, there's so many of the, of the narratives that we have been told as Americans in our schools, in our churches, in our institutions that are just flat out not true. Right. As we've written this book, as people have read it, I realized that most Americans, myself included, had no clue about the true nature of Abraham Lincoln right. and what he actually did. I would say, or, you know, a couple of things to that. Uh, one, yes, with the, I have the book too, and I'm, I'm, I'm making my way through it, uh, looking forward to finishing it. Um, one of the things that you bring up with Abraham Lincoln, and I always uh, talk about, and especially in the African American community, is you know the Emancipation Proclamation. But if you read before that, when he was saying, if there was a way I could save the institution of slavery and save the Union, I would do it. You know, so the the, the that 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 shows the heart to me. Well, yeah. <laughs> so there's beginning. there's a I mean the Emancipation Proclamation. There were five states, or four states, I think that did not secede from the union right they were northern states and yet they allowed slavery they allowed it. the emancipation proclamation is very specific where it frees the enslaved peoples from mm -hmm. and the four states maryland kentucky delaware i forget the name of the four states right now but those four states are not included in the emancipation proclamation and they don't get their freedom until after lincoln's assassinated right and and lincoln who had the emancipation proclamation written it was in his desk it was in his desk and he was not ready to release it yet because he was afraid about what those slave owners in the northern states were going to do if they read this proclamation. And so Horace Greeley, who was the heir to the New York Tribune, he wrote a scathing op-ed calling for the immediate emancipation of the slaves. Abraham Lincoln, rather than releasing the Emancipation Proclamation, which already he had written, he responded to Horace Greeley in an op-ed. And in his op-ed, he said, my primary object in this struggle is not to save or destroy slavery, it's to preserve the Union. And if I could save the Union without freeing a single slave, I would do it. Do it. If I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln responded by assuring Horace Greeley and the northern state slave owners 
that he didn't give a crap about black lives. Right. Now, what's fascinating is that quote is hanging at the Lincoln Memorial. There's a small museum at the base of the memorial. And if you walk in, it has different plaques of different sayings and quotes by Abraham Lincoln. There's one plaque with his quotes about the union. And that quote is hanging on like a four foot, Foot, one and a half foot tall, two and a half foot wide marble plaque. It's not lamenting that statement. It's not pointing it out and saying, I can't believe he said this. It's holding it up at look at how much Lincoln loved the union. So much that he didn't give a crap about what happened to the black lives. Yeah. So it's two things, two questions I want to make sure we get to here. And I want to kind of bring us around to uh, re- religious freedom, but also not leave out the fact that, you know, you, you, you talked about uh, America's never lost a war. Being in those, I think the closest thing we've come to losing was the Civil War. And it's interesting that uh, that loss in some areas is still being told as a the minority voice. I'm, I'm from the South. So I, I hear that minority voice. So they understand the minority voice when it's when it's them on that side. But they don't understand the minority voice when it's other people that don't look like them. I, I had to get that out. But I, I wanted to get to the, the point of bringing it back to the fact that we've used uh, religious, uh, the Bible, uh, you know, uh, Catholic, uh, the, the, the paper bulls, all of those things in order to do harm to to other people and you mentioned that you're still a a a person of faith and so i want to know how your identity has uh, you know what has it done to define your your theology and on the other side how has your theology um reckoned with your identity of being native american in america yeah well so this is a very long question and um i I've been wrestling with it not only for most of my life, I've even been wrestling with it very specifically in the last in the last uh, year and a half. I'll allude to this. I'll take about five minutes to allude to this. I've actually been preaching on this um, frequently over the past three months. I probably preached on this five or even six times in the past two or three months. And it was about a year ago, year and a half ago, I was wrestling with God because it's been 2000 years Mm. and not only as a native man, but I, I feel, well, it started as a native man. I feel as like an outsider to my faith. I feel like, you know, and I feel like the church wrestles with acknowledging the humanity of everybody. And I'm, God, it's been 2,000 years. Why are we still wrestling with this? Why do we have a problem acknowledging the humanity of everybody? I don't have time to take you through the whole journey of that, but there's a sermon. I'll send it to you afterwards where you can get the link for that. Um, I preached at a church called Forefront Church in New York City, and there's a few other places where I preached that sermon. Um, But uh, I began to realize that we have a difference between our written theologies and our lived theology, especially around the ministry of Jesus. So our written theology states that through the death of Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice as a blameless lamb on the cross, and through his resurrection, we are reconciled back to creator. The temple curtain tore in two, we have access into the Holy of Holies, and that reconciliation began at, or happened at the cross, right? This is our written theology. Our lived theology states that reconciliation happened at the birth. Mm. And so we read Jesus' ministry like he his ministry was the model of full inclusion now the problem is jesus ministry was not radically inclusive in some aspects yes if you were if you were jewish and you worked as a prostitute or you were bleeding or you had leprosy or you were a tax collector even if you were a samaritan jesus was radically inclusive of you if you were a gentile 
he was much more standoffish, maybe dismissive, and in some instances, even exclusive. There's three stories of Jesus interacting with Gentiles. First of all, there's the, the, the centurion, mm -hmm. a Roman centurion who wants his servant healed. Jesus recognizes he has great faith. He says, you can do this remotely. I know how authority works. And Jesus recognizes he has great faith. And he always rewards great faith. Mm -hmm. not just with healing, but with he touches the leper, he heals the whole story of the bleeding woman, he goes home with the tax collector, he goes into the village of the Samaritan woman. He does nothing for the centurion. He doesn't go into his home. He doesn't do anything except do the healing he was asked to do, but nothing else. The demoniac, a man Jesus meets who is possessed by demons. Jesus heals him, and as he's ready to leave, the demoniac begs Jesus to let him follow him, begs him. Jesus says no. He's one day approached by a Seraphonician woman, a Canaanite woman, a Gentile. Gentile. She wants her daughter healed, who's also possessed by a demon. Jesus says, I came primarily for the lost sheep of Israel. She's tenacious. She continues to ask. She wants a healing. Jesus says, why would I give to the dogs what was meant to the, for the children? She says, even the dogs eat the scraps on the table. The crumbs, yeah. Jesus says, wow, you get it. <laughs> he doesn't correct her, right? He doesn't say, my child, you're not a dog. He says, no, you get it. And he heals her, doesn't go into her home, doesn't go, right? So his three interactions with Gentiles are at best dismissive and at worst right out exclusive. Mm-hmm. People say, well, Acts 2, that was this radical, inclusive community. Yes, there were people from all over the world, but you know what? Oh, they were all proselytes. They were all Jews. All the men were circumcised. All the people ate kosher. They all attended synagogue. They all went. This was the American church, right? They all gave up their unique individual cultures, and they embraced the Jewish culture. And so Acts 2 is not the picture of radical inclusion either. Mm -hmm. We don't see radical inclusion until Acts 10. And it's initiated by the Holy Spirit, who appears to Cornelius in a vision, appears to Peter in a vision. And what's amazing, right, is Peter goes into Cornelius' house, and there's so many aspects of the story, I can't go into them all right now. <laughs> but he preaches, and as he's preaching, he sees the Holy Spirit falling on Cornelius and his family. And he, the circumcised believers who were with Peter were astonished that the Spirit of God was poured out even on Gentiles. Had no clue what they were doing was meant to include Gentiles. Peter sees this happening. And even though his entire Jewish upbringing told him that he was to keep separate from the Jews, even though his, or just separate from the Gentiles, even though his entire two and a half to three years with Jesus, he never went into a Gentile's home. In fact, when he got to Cornelius' house, he said, I shouldn't be here. He didn't say, oh yeah, Jesus did this. He's like, yeah, I shouldn't be here. And when Peter sees the Holy Spirit fall, he says, there's nothing to prevent me from baptizing you with water. Hmm. And he invites them into full fellowship. And so the challenge is, is when, because we, we believe, we all believe, right, that the reconciliation happens at the death and resurrection. But we read the Gospels like that reconciliation took place at the birth. Right. And the problem is, is when we, when we have that view, then we see Jesus' interactions with Gentiles as inclusive. Right. So we can avoid going into the home of someone whose our presence there would cause a social uproar or create problems or, or even inconvenience. We can tell people who want to join us in the work and yet their presence, because they're so different or they're so outside of our community, would be not only be a distraction, but would cause people to ask questions about why are they there and what are they doing? And we can say, no, you can't follow us. And when people who are tenacious and they won't give up and they keep begging and asking, we can say, fine, I'll give you what you want, but you have to remember there's a hierarchy here. And we can do those things and tell people we're still loving you. 
because that's what Jesus did. Mm. Instead of recognizing the reconciliation didn't happen at the birth, it happened at the death. Jesus, if he was going to keep the law perfectly, which what was required of him, that's how he was the blameless sacrifice, the law actually required him to be separate from the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. He had to, to be the blameless sacrifice. So again, I've been wrestling with this just for the past, for the past year and a half. Yeah. But this has huge implications about what does it mean for me, not only as a Navajo man, but even as the son of my mother, as a white man. Mm -hmm. Because both are Gentiles. Mm. What's fascinating, right, is the way Western Europe, white people have dealt with the tension of Jesus's ministry wasn't very inclusive, is they just made Jesus white. <laughs> you know what? And that that is a a common theme throughout everything. If you just make it uh, white, then it, it corrects. And, and it, so we just yeah. made him white so that we're for he loved us. But now if you really want to be loved by Jesus, you have to become white too. Right. Yeah. Instead of recognizing no, Let's acknowledge our written theology, which is the reconciliation happens at the death. And so let's stop using Jesus' ministry, especially his interaction with Gentiles, as a picture of inclusion. And let's, instead of asking what would Jesus do, let's ask what, through the blood of Jesus, through his death on the cross, but what is the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. calling us to do? which might even go against what we feel like we should be doing in the first place, which is absolutely, I'm sure, how Peter felt when he saw the Holy Spirit fall on uncircumcised Gentiles. Indeed, indeed. Now, you, you, you know, I, when I hear you talking here, it's like there needs to be truth telling not only from uh, our history in America, but those that uh, of certain faiths have to go back through their uh, you know, religious tradition and, and, and be truth tellers through that too. Um, yeah. we, we're not asking everybody to make this decision about America based on Christianity, but if you are Christian and you're, you're wrestling with these things, you should be wrestling with them and see what comes of that. And, 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 and sort of the last part I'll say about um, talking it through the Christian faith, you know, when we were talking the other day, we, I, I said, you know, what has always stuck out, stood out to me was when Jesus said, you know, you'll do these things and even more things you will do because I will send the Holy Spirit. And so now it makes it even more sense to me. It's like, because he wasn't as radical and wasn't as 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 um, inclusive. And so the Holy Spirit made it go even further. And so, you know, we, we both could start preaching here, but it, it, it's, it's something in that to say to America, you know, um, you, you, can, you can like your founding fathers or your founding framers, but there's more that you can do past that. That, that shouldn't be the, the, the pinnacle of what you think America is. And that passage where Jesus says, you'll do greater things than me, right? We read that often as Christians, like that's hyperbole. Right. Right, uh, whatever, yeah. Well, well, when Peter was standing in a Gentile's home, preaching to them and watching the Holy Spirit fall upon them, he was doing and seeing something that Jesus never did or saw, which was Gentiles being radically included into the church. And so you can argue very easily that what Peter was doing was absent. And Jesus, when he made the, again, as you point out, when he said that, he said, I'm going to go away. That's better for you. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And this is what's going to enable you to do things even greater than me. And it was absolutely the Holy Spirit who initiated this interaction between Cornelius and Peter. It was the Holy Spirit who fell, which prompted Peter to say, there's nothing left for me to do than but baptize you with water. You've already been baptized by the Spirit of God. I mean, this is just a symbol. Right. Now, usually we, we, we cut off during this time, but Mark, I'm going to take the liberty. This, this conversation is going so well. I'm going to take the liberty to go a little bit longer, and hopefully the people that are with us uh, will enjoy and continue to, to stay with us with that. Because it, it's a couple of things I want to make sure we get to uh, with that. Uh, so we, we talked about theology and how you have formed it and through there. But I, I want to kind of 
bring it to, okay, we, we've said what the problem is, uh, but let's, let's bring it even deeper for today. Um, what is the biggest threat to Native American or Indigenous people uh, faith freedom today in America? <clears throat> what, what do you say the biggest threat is um, for that? So I really think, I mean, there's so many, again, there's so many ways I could answer this. Um, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest threats, and this comes from both the conservative and the liberal, the progressive and the, the evangelical, the mainstream evangelical sides, which is this belief that the United States of America is a Christian nation. I often speak to people and I tell people that the United States of America is not, never has been, nor will it ever be Christian, right? When you read even the message of Jesus, he was adamant he did not come to establish Christian empire. He came to plant a church and he was calling the church to lay down its life. And so when you, when you have a nation that believes its job is to be Christian. Now you're not only having to find a way to share your faith and invite people to share it with you, but now you need to find a way to compel people. Mm -hmm. And that's where you run into a problem, right? This is where even in the book, in chapters three and four of this book, we talk about how the church got from the teachings of Jesus who said things like, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, how we got from that to a doctrine of discovery that says you can kill people who don't look like, act like, eat like, or worship like you do. And it happened through this understanding of we're going to make a christian empire we're going to create christendom right this is what constantine did based on the teachings of eusebius he created a christian empire which radically changed what it meant to be the church the first through third century you join the church through your baptism your confession your discipleship and your community after constantine you were now a member of the church based on your citizenship in the empire it created this heresy, and Augustine, who was writing in the fourth century, he had to figure out what do we do about this, or writing in the fifth century, sorry. He had to figure out what do we do with this heresy, right? He was one of the major theologians after, after Constantine, and his dilemma was, do we collude with this heresy of Christianity, or do we prophesy to it? Mm. And he writes a just war theory, right? The just war theory has two purposes. A, it's to, to help Christian nations fight wars more justly, but B, to justify how the citizens of these, Christian citizens of these nations can go off and kill in the name of God and country, because again, a plain text reading of Jesus' teaching doesn't allow that. So you need to do some theological gymnastics. So I always said the fact that we had a just war theory, or he wrote a just war theory, was evidence that he was colluding with empire instead of mm -hmm. prophesying to it. But I wanted to find where he crossed the line. And in his book on the correction of the Donatists, the Donatists were a heretical group. They were kind of a thorn in his side, all of his ministry, all of his life. And in chapter five of that book, he's asking a good question, but with a horrible premise. He's asking, what is the role of a Christian empire, of a Christian king in a Christian empire? Right? They never had this before. They've always been the oppressed people in a pagan empire. And now he's asking, now that we're in power, what's our role? It's not a bad question, except he accepts the premise of there is such a thing as a Christian empire, which again, according to the teaching of Jesus, doesn't exist. And he concludes that the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to use fear, punishment, and pain to compel people to worship God and obey the church. And this is so far outside the teachings of Jesus. 
it's so far you know when jesus was with his disciples and they said hey you were rejected by that village back there can we be the ones to call down fire from heaven and destroy them he's like no <laughs> right when the disciples come to him and they say jesus we found this guy and he was casting out demons in your name but he wasn't a part of our group and so we stopped him and they're pretty proud of themselves and he said, don't stop them. I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water in my name will not lose their reward. But then he goes on. He says, if you cause one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better if you tied a millstone around your neck and jumped into the ocean. He said, if your hand causes you to believe you're better than someone else, cut it off. It's better to go into life maimed than with two hands to be thrown into hell he says if your eye causes you to believe you're better than someone else gouge it out it's better to go into life blind than with two eyes to be thrown to hell jesus saves his most intense warnings his most clearest threats not for the roman oppressors not for the Pharisees and the Sadducees who he was in conflict with the entire time not for the teachers of the law who were leading people astray not even for sinners or tax collectors or people who are living outside of the way they were supposed to be living as Jewish people. His most clear threats were to his disciples when they started thinking that because they were with Jesus, they could now use power to compel people to do their biddings. Mm. And I think this is the greatest threat right, is this nation was built on this heresy of Christian empire. And I, I can't tell you how many churches I go into and I have to remind the people, white evangelicals, you are not God's chosen people. You do not have a land covenant with the God of Abraham and Turtle Island is not your promised land. The United States of America is not, never has been, nor will it ever be Christian. And because people from both the left and the right think that is their goal, they are merely only going to institute and reinstitute the very things that cause these problems in the first place. When we feel like our job is to compel faith, we've lost. We've lost. Jesus said that very clearly. When his disciples felt like their job was to compel and enforce faith, he's like, you might as well just tie a millstone and I can jump into the ocean. There's, there's, yeah. that's, there's nothing there. Mark, that, your explanation of that is, is excellent. And I, I think this is a great point for us to, to end on here just because I know that, you know, a lot of times when we talk and have these conversations with other people, we, we, we talk to it in a in a way that maybe our uh, evangelical friends can't draw in on. But I just think you found a common place to say, hey, OK, if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to do these things, be like in, the, in this way. Um, but also know that America is not a Christian nation and we're a nation of, for the supposed to be we the people for all people. And, and that's my plug to go and watch uh, Mark's uh, TED talk. We're going to drop that link in there. Uh, about uh, the words, we the people. Um, that's also my place to say um, the BJC will be having our book club in January, and we will be reading Mark Charles' book, The Unsettling Truths, and I hope you would join us for that. Mark, it's been great to have you today. Uh, we look forward to continuing our uh, talk and, and, and relationship with you, and uh, I want to give you a chance to shout out anything you want the people to to, to see or, or, or go do or as we as we finish today. Yeah, I just would encourage people to go to my website, which is wirelesshogan.com. I'm very active on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, even TikTok a little bit. Um, all of the links to my social media account are on my website. You can buy a signed copy of my book there. And that page where you can buy the signed copy of the book, we have a lot of other resources. I did a 14-part video series going through the entire book. And so there's more in-depth uh, dialogue about each chapter of the book. Uh, we put podcasts and other things that I've done around the book on that website as well. So not only is it a place where you can buy a signed copy, but you can get a lot of other free resources as to supplement you as you're reading through the book. 
Um, and yeah, I, I really hope that, you know, we, Sing Chan and I wrote this book with the goal of trying to initiate a dialogue. And um, we title it Unsettling Truths and the feedback we get from it is people tell us, yeah, the, I, I, I struggle to say it's a good book, <laughs> but it's definitely unsettling, right? It, it, it changes my paradigm, it causes me to think and it's, it's very unsettling, but it's a needed and a necessary unsettling. And so, yeah, I, I appreciate the chance to talk with you about it today. And I encourage people, if you haven't read it, you can find a copy of it anywhere you want online or sign copies on my website and then engage with me and, and look at the resources we have on social media. So thank you, Charles. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thank you all again for joining us for this uh, segment of Voices of Faith Freedom. Till next time. Thank you.